Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kiva Clerkin. She received her PhD in biopharmaceutics in 2018 from the School of Pharmacy in Trinity College, Dublin. Following this, she took a position as a uh, postdoctoral researcher within the Department of Molecular Medicine at the Royal College of Surgeons, Ireland. And in 2019, she was appointed as a lecturer within the School of Pharmacy at China Medical University and Queen's University Belfast Joint College. That's located in Shenyang, People's Republic of China. Now here, Kiva contributes to the development of new and innovative curricula for pharmaceutical and biotechnology students. As a result, Kiva is in involved in education research to understand and stimulate a higher level of cognitive learning by investigating students' attitudes to scientific subjects, the impact of student co-designs on their own curriculum in partnership with Queen's University Partnership Program, and understanding students' requirements for online trans transnational education. This feature has the potential to foster a commitment to lifelong education in students, to help them work effect efficiently and effectively within a multidisciplinary team, and provide them with the required skills to become world leaders in healthcare provision. And now I'll hand it off to Dr. Kiva Clerke. Uh, if you can share your screen. I'll stop my share. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully uh, we will be all able to see this now. Yeah, we can see it. Great. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so my name is Kiva and for the last about two and a half years I've been working for CQC to, with my colleagues Dr Tahir Hatihat, who I believe is on the call today, and our Vice Dean of the College, Professor Gavin Andrews, to understand better our expectations um, from our students for a transnational education programme. So just a quick overview of what CQC is. It was formed in 2014 um, in collaboration with the China Medical University. So one of the foremost medical universities in China and Queen's University Belfast, which is ranked in the top 180 universities in the world and is part of the Russell Group, which aims for staff to deliver world-class teaching and research. Um, our students are recruited from the top tier of their Gaokao exam and currently we have 435 students and um, they're enrolled and they will complete a foundation year program before entry then onto a BSc degree in pharmaceutical science and biotechnology and in 2018 uh, we were very proud to see our first graduation of 37 students um, who received their QUB degree at CQC and since then we've had two further graduations and we're hoping for the fourth graduation this summer. So for those of you who don't know, Shenyang is in the northeastern part of China. It's about a four hour train journey um, northeast of Beijing. And if we were to take a direct flight from Belfast, it would take 16 hours. But I can assure you that no such direct flight exists. And that journey is a little bit longer. Typically, we would take this journey maybe um, up to five times a year, and it would last for about six weeks, where we are here on campus in Shenyang, delivering face-to-face -face learning to our students. However, SARS-CoV-2 then saw a halt to that and it forced our teaching as all teaching to be remote and move online. And I think everyone in the education sector had to then stop and think about what strategies they could implement to improve or to ensure that they were still delivering this high standard of teaching. Um, and so as an educator, I really wanted to know what can I do to help benefit the students um, in Shenyang, given this change in teaching. So this study really wanted to um, understand student expectations of online learning and then to utilise the information that we gather um, to tailor our programme um, and ensure that we are addressing the new needs of our students who are enrolled on these programmes. Um, at Queen's, we use uh, the virtual learning environment platform called Canvas, and I thought it would be appropriate just to share with you here um, one module that I am the module coordinator of, which is a level one chemistry module. And um, as Christine alluded to, this is in partnership with the Queen's University Partnership Programme. Um, and this is really where we're trying to get our students to become the co-creators of their own 
of their own curriculum um, and just based on their their feedback how they wanted their, their modules to be designed so this is how we're trying to um, tailor all modules so we've just started off with a few but eventually hopefully we will tailor them better but it starts with um, a canvas quiz and these are all formative assessments uh, a canvas quiz to introduce new terminology that they will um, come into contact with during their lecture and then at the very end we have um, a recap quiz and this is great um, to give both staff and students an understanding um, where the learning outcomes have been met or if there are any gaps in their understanding that we can then tailor revision sessions or seminars better towards. Um, within each lecture we would give a, a short introduction uh, just to place that lecture into context and just to reinforce the importance of it. But with the movement then to our online learning, obviously our lectures couldn't be delivered in person. So we broke up our lectures typically into three parts of 15 minutes uh, recordings. And these were then um, live, made live on Canvas. Um, after each lecture, we would have another quiz uh, just to make sure that students are understanding the material, but an effort really to keep them engaged with what they are learning. Um, and then depending on the lecture type, so stereochemistry, it's very practical. Homework could be provided and then that would be re re um, reviewed during a revision session or tutorial. Our revision sessions were held live. So um, this was really to give the students opportunity to ask any questions that they had uh, during, a, the, during that lecture series. And from my experience, um, this was really engaging with students. Um, so with MS Teams, uh, they could put up, raise their hands. There was the emoji aspect of that platform. So we were getting love hearts and hand clappings, which was great. Um, but it was just another opportunity for students to just engage with staff and to try and bridge that gap um, that they're not currently able to have with, in terms of fostering that relationship with us. So our first um, task was to just survey all of our students. This was anonymous um, and this was voluntary. Um, and it was just really to understand um, how they felt towards this move to online learning. So we received some positive comments, um, which included that they preferred online learning, and um, that they were not nervous about accessing the material on Canvas. And this could be because we do provide training workshops for all our students prior to their use of Canvas. And most students uh, knew who to contact if they had a question. But as always, there were some negatives. Um, some students did not always have a quiet place to study. And um, in our experience, a lot of our CQC students tend to study at night time and this tend to study in their dorms and their dorms can have up to four people in any one room um, so we think that that is what this comment is referring to and some students have that poor interconnection. Other comments um, included that most students preferred the lectures in video and voice format. Uh, they were requesting for greater and varied feedback so um, uh, obviously in writing but also videos um, and voice recording feedback and clear target goals to be established each week for students and this is something that we really felt that students were crying out for and um, to have these targets that they could reach each week. Um, other challenges then that the students faced uh, or what questions that we wanted to understand should I say from the survey was that um, what are the major challenges associated with the switch to online learning? What advantages and disadvantages did the students feel towards face-to-face -to -face online and hybrid teaching? And whether or not they thought that the current resources that we were providing to our students, such as the Canvas quizzes, the discussion boards, and learning science resources were useful tools. But one big thing that we faced was that only 75 students out of our cohort enrolled in level one, two and three, which was 324 students participated. And so what we were really assessing here was the engaging stu students and we weren't really understanding what was happening with those students who may not be engaging with these platforms. So for those of you 
who use Canvas, you're probably aware of um, the new analytics tool that is available on Canvas. And this is great because it provides reports um, for students. And in those reports, you can have their overall course grade and um, the number of page views, uh, the last time they viewed a page and their number of participations if there are activities like canvas quizzes implemented into a module and so what we did was across all modules we collected these reports and had a look at those students who may not have been um, engaging particularly well with the module or with modules across their degree level and our vice and um, our our Vice Dean, Professor Gavin Andrews, circulated then another anonymous voluntary survey and um, he was asked to do this because we thought that um, students would probably better engage with him rather than uh, with us. So we asked the students to complete another survey and this was targeted towards the non-engaging students. And again, there were some positives. 80% of students were familiar with Canvas and how to use it. All students were able to access devices. 52% um, of students agreed they had good speed with accessing Canvas. However, the negatives were that 47% of students agreed that this transition to online learning was challenging. They had difficulty logging on, 40% of them. And then 30% of the students agreed that they were accessing relevant material from their classmates or other sources that were not Canvas. And this was probably due to the difficulty in accessing Canvas. Um, However, um, Queen's really discouraged this and it was it found that many students were sharing uh, the recordings through QQ and it meant that students were not able then to access the, the engaging in activities and that further hindered their ability to develop their critical thinking and cognitive learning. So this was really, really strongly encouraged and one of our key goals coming from this survey will definitely be, well, how can we promote the use of, of Canvas? 36% um, of students had difficulty managing their time, so there's this issue about targeting gets uh, clear objectives each week appearing again. From this, we wanted to therefore know how to make the transition to online learning easier for the students. How can we help students better manage their time? And how can we better promote Canvas use amongst our students? Um, this survey was released prior to our students leaving for um, their winter break. So we were very lucky. But during this time, we developed a new module, which was called the CQC Student Support. And this module aimed to provide really a one-stop shop for all students where they could develop skills required for their BSc degrees but ultimately their careers and it included skills like time management, note-taking, how to cope with stress, how to learn in a digital space and other skills that are displayed there on the right hand side. It also included really important documents that students would need routinely, um, such as ex um, exceptional circumstances, progression policies, and there are also information about the role of the personal tutor and the advisor studies as well there. Um, we also created an online discussion board on this page, and this was really hoped that students could share their experiences or ask, answer any queries that students might have in this kind of like student hub. Unfortunately, however, it hasn't been very successful, um, so we will be re relaunching this module in the next academic year and thinking about how to improve the engagement of our students during this discussion board. One of our approaches in order to promote Canvas is the announcements on this module um, and on that announcements we would um, advertise upcoming events uh, such as our CQC speaker series and this invites world leaders in research uh, that's applicable to pharmaceutical science and biotechnology to deliver um, their research to the CQC students and uh, this is facilitated by Dr Tahir Hattihead who's on the call today. So after they returned from their winter break, we held a focus group with the students and we invited all students. And we were really, really lucky in this regard that all students 
attended. Um, we introduced the aims of this project to the students and this was delivered on MS Teams and afterwards we had a focus group where we broke out our students into different channels um, like breakout rooms um, and in each channel there would have been a maximum of 10 students in there and with the support of our admin team and some of the academic staff we were able to move through these channels to ensure that correct conversation was being had in terms that they weren't talking about what they did uh, during their winter break but they, they were talking about um, their expectations for online learning and just really to facilitate the conversation and we received a lot of information during this session it was really really uh, successful and um, so some of the information that we collected was that 82 percent of students agreed that canvas was a useful resource that there was abundant resources in terms of the discussion boards learning science resources canvas quizzes available to them it was easy to learn it was more convenient than being able to just circulate recordings to each other and I think for me which was um, uh, which I love to see was that students identified that Canvas was a great opportunity to deepen their understanding and I think that is really important and um, that they're able to to share with that um, unfortunately students again have the issue of per internet connection um, we asked them then about their difficulties with this transition over to online learning. Um, and so the major concerns were again around no clear objectives, too many distractions studying from home, difficulty to manage their own time. And this was across all levels. There were other um, issues that they faced, such as uh, too much to learn per class. And this was particularly for the level one, who we think um, this could be due to the fact that when they move into level one, um, there is a lot of termino new terminology that they, they have to become familiar with quite quickly. Um, there were fewer opportunities to strengthen their English. And this was particularly for level one and level two. Now in level one, we, do, we have developed um, uh, a course called ESAP, which stands for English for Scientific Academic Purposes, um, and that runs in parallel with our Level 1 Physiology module, um, and it just really is to support the students' understanding because we are aware that there is such a, a high terminology weight to those modules. But unfortunately, students felt that with the online learning, there was reduced positivity. And this could be due to the fact that the number of social interactions, not only with their peers, but also with staff is next to none at the moment. Um, and also there was a lack of motivation. We also asked them about their face-to-face -face online learning hybrid um, advantages and disadvantages. And these are just um, a, a, the, a number that came up the most common. So um, a lot of these suggestions um, we would have expected. So for example, face-to-face, -face, you can engage more with the teacher, it's easier to concentrate and you can ask a question to the teacher. And I think for me as a, as a teacher, this is probably the biggest challenge that I have had, not being able to adapt my method of teaching to adjust based on the, what the question is being asked to me. Um, unfortunately, with that method, those students can't look back at the lecture, which they can do with online learning. And I, it's stressful and nervous. And I think this comes from the fact that at CQC, some staff members employ a flipped classroom approach where students are expected to come to the lecture prepared and be ready to answer questions that the, the academic might have. Uh, with online learning, there was that degree of flexibility and convenience. But again, students said that they had a lack of self-control and they felt that they were very uh, able to procrastinate. And they were difficult to develop their practical skills, given that these were all delivered uh, dry. Um, and it can be difficult to open our resources. And um, in terms of the hybrid, this was the best way. It, it gave students free time, um, but unfortunately they didn't like the idea that it wasn't a complete schedule. We also asked students, well, what advice would you give to students who weren't engaging? And it was really great to see some of the comments that came through here. Um, it surrounds the idea that let's create a timetable, let's set ourselves clear targets. And I think by contacting your AOS, the advisor studies, and um, students are able to identify that 
as an advisor of studies, we are there to support you in your learning. But also on that note, they were also able to identify that this is uh, the new way of learning and that but that it is convenient and if um, carried out uh, properly, uh, there are so many advantages associated with online learning that can help you to develop your, your deep understanding, which is, I think, what we all are all trying to achieve um, at third level education. And I think most interesting of all, um, we were able to um, significantly identify that students preferred the hybrid model of teaching. Um, and this was across all, all levels that this, uh, um, this approach was preferred. So I think going forward, um, there is a lot that we need to think about in terms of how we can deliver this hybrid model successfully and will that mean that all of our lectures are still remaining as recordings and that we have our revision sessions face to face um, and in terms of practicality would that mean that staff would then move out to China um, at the end of a, sem a, se a semester to be delivering these live sessions in blocks and if that was the case well, what impact would that have in terms of student performance within a given module do we still run the practicals dry or do we revert back to having wet projects to ensure that the, the practical skills of our students are developed um, optimally? And if that is the case, then how do we facilitate that? So I think there are a number of questions still remaining, um, but I think going forward, um, if we are able to set clear targets for our students each week, if we're able to communicate informally with students, we might be able to improve and promote Canvas use and therefore their engagement and development of their critical thinking. Um, encourage varied feedback amongst our students to promote positivity and also to motivate our students. We're in the stages of developing a, a foundation year module, and this module really does aim to bridge the gap between the Chinese Chinese education system and this UK education system, but also within that module to allow students prior to entry into level one to become form more familiar with um, this method of hybrid teaching. Um, but also, how can we promote staff and student engagement? And I know from being fortunate enough to have spent time out in Shenyang and deliver teaching, there were so many social interactions held by um, our students such as uh, the dumpling bling bling festival but this was just great to promote and foster that staff and student relationship that we're currently lacking but i am hopeful through practice refining disseminating and feedback will be able to optimize our hybrid model of teaching in order to ensure that our students um, are um, exceptional and are successful in, in their career, whether they are in the UK or in China or wherever else they may be in this ever evolving world. So on that note, I'd like to just say thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have at this stage. Thank you, Dr. Kiva. Uh, it looks like Melanie has a question. Sorry, that was me using the hand clapping emoji. But I do <laughs> have a question, actually, um, <laughs> now, now that I have your attention. Um, I, I, I found it interesting what you said about student staff interactions missing. And, and I, I, I felt that that's saying we don't have a dumpling bling bling festival, although I'm dying to know what that's like. Um, but, but we have noticed as well that, you know, those everyday interactions you have at the cafeteria or those <laughs> small things go away and anecdotally I'm, I'm really worried that it may impact on the students ability to use English um, as well as as previous generations who had this on-campus interaction with us is that something that you see as well we, well, we are very um, aware of that and it was raised in one of our, our surveys that, or in our focus group that we had that students also felt that they weren't able to develop their English as well as they would have previously. Um, in order to do that, there is we did develop um, with the support of our English language teachers this 
ESAP course. Mm -hmm. um, so we hope that that will improve students' English um, and that really is tailored around the lectures. We have our CQC speaker series and that is delivered through English. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of uh, promoting um, further interactions, it's something that we all will have to do. Um, online and um, as also whenever we are there on campus yeah. to make up for that. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, looks like David has a question. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting presentation because it cuts through some of the issues that uh, we have. Um, you have indicated that your students are using Canvas. Um, one of the issues in China is about accessibility to some of these platforms. Are the students accessing your Canvas at Queen's University or you've implemented that in China? Um, I think, uh, so I think uh, how to answer this question. So we are aware that our students have difficulty with the internet connection. So um, our students in China should have full access to Canvas, but because of um, issues uh, that is difficult for our students. And all I can say is that currently at Queens, they are trying to investigate that issue to see if they can overcome it in other ways. But I think in, in terms of other UK institutes, they're facing the same problem and we might just all have to work together in order to resolve that. But we're, we know that uh, Queens have run a trial uh, with our CQC students in order to understand what, um, what is happening and how to overcome that. But at, that's at the very beginning stages. And we're hoping that hopefully by September, um, their accessibility will be uh, much improved. Okay, thank you. Sorry, just a point of clarification. Are they accessing the Canvas that is running here in the, uh, running at Queens? Okay, I think that. Okay. If I, can jump in, if I can jump in here to clarify uh, for David, uh, Canvas is has several servers worldwide and it depends on how Canvas logistics are run. Uh, some of the servers are located uh, in Asia, others are located in North America or in Europe. However, there are no servers inside China that we built as a Queen University for students to access. So students are dependent on the service that is provided by Canvas. Canvas on several occasions uh, announced that some of the servers have been blocked in China. So oh. that, that become the issue. It was it was for a short period of time. However, what we what we have is the the biggest issue with, with with Canvas is we have a limited space for modules or for courses. So if we continue uploading videos and video recording to the module space, we can't have enough space for uploading all the lecture materials. So we were using other platforms like Microsoft Stream. And unfortunately, Microsoft Stream in China has been blocked. So students can log on to the page but they can spend three or four hours waiting for video to, op to open for them. And for that reason, we looked for other emergency uh, solutions like providing downloadable videos. And that had come the, the problem where students are less engaging now with Canvas, less engaging with the online material because they can download the video from their friends or peers and share that via QQ. Thank you. Looks like I think Michael Groves is first and then Dagua. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thanks for a really interesting presentation. Um, I was very interested in you, you talking about developing a module to help the transition for students into hybrid on learning, online learning. Could you tell us a little bit more about um, the approach you're going to take and can we steal it from you, please? Well, I don't know. If, I don't. I. I don't know what I can say here. Um. So yeah, this. Um. Really, what we have noticed is that. Um. In level one, we have a physiology module, and unfortunately, our pass rate is not very good with that module. And we are hoping that this foundation year module will try to. Um. Not 
um, re review all of that material that they will learn in level one, but give students the basis um, and uh, for what we probably more like a GCSE level to just make sure that they are developing those critical skills that they can uh, then translate over into their level one. So that will be the basis for this foundation year module. Um, we will be hoping that we can cover um, some of the material that we're doing on ESAP as well within this module because we find that students really are engaging with it and really enjoying it actually as well and um, so we're hoping that we can implement that within this module so that when it when they do come into level one they won't have that that shock and um, how we are hoping to deliver this and um, so there is a challenge given that our students in that foundation year will not be considered to be Queen's students at that point of entry but through Canvas and um, free Canvas we're hoping to deliver this module um, and with our colleagues in CMU we're hoping together to deliver to deliver this module um, at this stage, uh, we're not hoping to carry out practicals. We're just hoping to provide opportunities to develop their critical thinking. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that will go first and then John Menzies. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for such a, a informative presentation and sharing your experiences. Um, my question is about the CQA. Uh, I think uh, I think in your survey, uh, you know, quite a large proportion of the students uh, had difficulty uh, accessing the um, you know session materials, etc. Uh, just wondering, uh, you know, what to do with those students, how the learning objectives are met, uh, you know, achieved with those students. Uh, what, what, um, you know, what other kind of uh, measures have you taken to uh, compensate for that? Uh, will there be, uh, you know, whether there local support which you can rely on uh, to, to help, uh, you know, um, solve those problems? And um, so we're very lucky that some of our delivery team is actually um, still in Shenyang. Um, so there is still that point of contact and some of our admin team is there. So there's that as well. And um, in terms of ensuring that our learning outcomes are being met, um, I think this can really just be down to our assessment and making sure that we're blueprinting correctly and ensuring that our practicals are effectively um, measuring our learning outcomes um, and really as well during our revision sessions we um, we do circulate um, messages to our students just requesting that if they are finding any issue particularly challenging to please get in contact with that current member of staff in order to uh, deliver further information on that. Okay thank you very much. John Menzies, I think. Thanks, Christine. Hi, Kiva. Thanks for your talk. I, I thought it was interesting to see some of our kind of hunches about what students might be experiencing being backed up, backed up by some data. I wanted to ask you about these this this perception students have that they need a bit of internal structure in their week almost and giving these weekly targets um, and giving them objectives week to week. I think that that could be quite a simple and effective thing to do. What, what, can, what do you envisage these kind of targets to be? What sort of advice information would you be giving on a week to week basis? Because I guess we have to be a, a bit careful about information overload. And you know, if every course organizer is saying, you gotta do this, this and this, what would it kind of look like to the student when you were giving that, uh, trying to develop that structure? Um, so I think I, I think I understand uh, your question um, that you're how do we envisage our um, targets to be and um, I think we're really really fortunate in the fact that uh, of the idea of formative assessments like I think it would provide us so much information and if we are able to give students um, so the way our modules are set up after each block significant block of learning there is that recap quiz and currently our teaching is delivered synchronously and asynchronously but if we are able to provide timelines for when uh, these sessions might need to be completed by and just maybe even one of the requests that students made was that even during our lecture to identify um, better and more clearly even though 
even though the learning outcomes are always identified at the beginning of a lecture and even in that blurb of introduction to the lecture, but even going through the lecture to just make it really clear to them that this is the learning outcome that you're reaching now and this is what you will be assessed on. Um, and I think through the formative assessments and just um, making it sure crystal clear for the students where these learning outcomes are being targeted in terms of um, either a lecture or a practical, I think what I hope that we'll be able to um, be able to provide more targets for our students to be able to reach themselves and promote their own um, motivation and positive reinforcement because I think that's what they really need at this stage. Yeah, yeah. That, that's great, thanks. I don't know if Christine's going to let me, but I've got another question. Can I go again, Christine? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and this is this is a wee bit off topic too, so I apologise. But but Kiva, you mentioned this um, at the start, um, this idea of co-creation in, in yeah. the course. Would you be able to talk about how you did that and what kind of constraints and limitations you put on the co-creation process on on the student side? So what were they what were they allowed to become involved in, and what did you sort of reserve? as um, as, as uh, boundaries and what the staff would make decisions around. Okay, um, so we've been running this project, myself and another colleague who unfortunately is on leave at the moment, but um, we together have been working on this project for about two years. And why we started this was because in level two and level three, um, just to put it into a bit of context, um, level two and level three are, we felt that the students were weren't able to develop their understanding of chemistry as well as they should have in things like spectroscopy um, and molecular modeling. So we wanted to look at then what was happening at the very basic level and just make sure that we are assessing what we're delivering, that it is current and it is relevant. So we, um, like I'm sure everywhere else have student reps and we recruited our student reps and we I told them what our plan was and we invited them to participate and um, if they felt comfortable and um, one of the great things about our students are that they're really um, engaging um, and eager to help wherever they can. So we got them on board, we circulated a survey, just general feedback, much like a module review, just to, to say, make sure that whether the targets were clear, whether they thought this was relevant um, and, and appropriate, were we delivering the material correctly? And we got feedback from that. And um, together with the students, the student reps and ourselves, we were able to access uh, this material. And we asked the students then to think about these answers, the clear um, indicators that were being pulled from that survey to think about it um, and that we would meet together and talk about, there might've been 10 particular things. So we met together and we talked about it. And thankfully we haven't had um, two drastic changes that students have been requesting. Um, um, but they, the, one of the things that they did want, again, was just more structure with the modules and um, they wanted more resources, more practices. And so we've implemented them. And um, one of the things they also requested was for uh, one of the important techniques they'll have to learn is spectroscopy. And I think one of the aspects that was missing was uh, uh, molecular um molecular orbital theory. And so we've now further developed in that region just to help support the, the students. But each year then, the last two years after we've implemented those strategies, um, we've re really received positive feedback from students. And um, one thing they also requested was to encourage to promote students um, was that some of the uh, formative assessment was actually converted to summative assessment and that contributed then to the final year module mark, which we've also implemented. Um, so we're hoping now to see um, whether or not in the next uh, year and two years, uh, whether or not there is that improvement in level two and level three based on this approach. And if so, we're hoping then to maybe translate this across for more modules. That's great, thanks. There's no other questions. Do you mind if I ask a question? Yeah. So earlier in the talk, you said that there was a discussion session or discussion boards, but that the students did not engage. Do you know why they did not engage? Um, 
Our, uh, we don't know why. Um, so uh, with our discussion board on this particular module, this was there for students to provide their own feedback, uh, to provide their own experiences of being a student at CQC. In other modules, we have discussion boards where students um, will send you directly an email of a question that they have. And so what we do is we put that question onto the discussion board um, with the answer and allow students to interact there. But it's, it's just, I think um, students are maybe a little bit shy um, because oh. with the discussion board their names are published and um, how to anonymize that might be a method to improve discussion there. I see. <laughs> Thank you. There are there any more questions? Uh, David? Um, you did mention that at the moment you do fly fly in faculty and you deliver over six weeks. Um, from your experience, is that six weeks sufficient to engage in these different forms of assessment, uh, sorry, of delivery and, and uh, encouraging student engagement and be able to do assessment at the end or how do you implement that? So in the past, uh, was the six weeks um, a sufficient time? Um, I think yes. Um, I think it's sufficient time in terms of uh, the demands on staff. And I think in terms of the, the way uh, taking into account all the natural breaks within the, the, the year, um, I think it works uh, well. But in terms of is it sufficient time to ensure students' engagement, I don't think, I think the answer there is no. I don't think we ever will have enough time for that. But I think if we're more uh, clever and efficient with the way we deliver these formative assessments and to just make sure that they set are set up with target goals hopefully we will see um, that engagement and going forward um, whether or not we will be expected to spend up to six weeks and um, that's still being discussed by um, senior management hey professor Jean I'm just trying to fix up my camera my camera was <laughs> no worries <laughs> Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Jin Japan from University of Leicester. Uh, I'm, ju I'm just curious uh, that you, you made a, a comment. Uh, thank you for a very informative uh, talk and, and, and the discussion. I find that very useful. And we are we, we share a lot of issues with, with you. And, and uh, so uh, we, we just had our student staff meeting before this one. So, uh, so we finished our and we were talking about almost exactly the same sort of issue. Uh, and we try one thing we don't have uh we have I mean, we, we have a joint like you we have a joint institute with Italian university of technology because uni of Celeste. but one thing we don't have is we don't have a local team there so we we 100 percent rely on sending people over to there and and some this is something we're considering of doing so we are we're hopefully we're going to recruit some staff over there where we are in the process of doing that i just want you to share a little bit of experience with that. So you, you do mention that you have local staff and and uh, are the academics uh, staff and we, we have local admin team, but you 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 probably have local academic staff. And uh, are they are they hundred percent based? And how was experience? And do you say that it is really sort of health thing? So I just want to uh, learn from your experience of having what impact. Uh, you have to have people actually physically there. Um, so we have, we currently are a team of six academic staff, um, one of whom is um, is in China um, 100% of the time. And um, so we're really, really fortunate to have her there um, to get feedback. Um, in terms of our admin team, uh, so our admin team is Oh, I'll do a, I'll do quick maths now. Um, there's about six admin team, and uh, one is is Chinese, um, Pippin, and she is there 100% of the time. Um, and I I think without them being there, um, we wouldn't have had the same success this year moving to online learning. So we're extremely fortunate for them. Um, I think um. Queen's is always encouraging staff if they're interested to be there 100% to be on the ground. Um, but sometimes that's just not feasible. Um, so and that, that one academic, I understand that one academic staff, is she or he, 
uh, 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 commonly based there or is just uh, yes yeah, so she's 100 chinese based okay so and then that but is that it is, is the contract with queens or is the contract with with, with that that's a um i am not the person to be no, asking okay. this question oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, um yeah. sorry I, i'm curious because i'm i'm in the process of doing that that's why I know. okay thank you very much thank you thank you Are there any other questions? There is something in the chat box, maybe. Oh, okay. Evni, yeah. that's me. Yes, um, I'm Vindya, by the way. Evni is my daughter. I just could not see the option to change um, the name to my name. Oh, Usually no the worries. option is there. And she had an online class, so in this online world. So I'm Vindya from Queen Mary. Um, so we also have a um, joint program. So thank you so much. Some of the issues were right on um, and what we uh, talk about every day as well. I just have a question uh, kind of following from David's question um, about your model. You mentioned six weeks. Um, is it like um, each, you mentioned there are five of you who are traveling back and forth. So is it one of you spends one week there and then another member of staff spends another week there? So how does the six week model uh, really work? Um, well, we have such large number of students on our courses um, that we actually, the, we would all fly out at that beginning. Um, so, for example, we would fly out in, at September and then there would be a natural break and we would return home. So generally speaking, um, when we are there, we are all there together during those six weeks. Same. And I think that's really good as well for staff morale um, when in when in Shenyang. Sure. So all, all of you um, go and stay there for six weeks in one go. Yeah. OK, I see. And then the rest of the year you deliver remotely. So when we are actually so we would spend probably about 24 weeks of the year in Shenyang. OK, I see. Okay. The remaining time, um, how the natural uh, timetable flows, the remaining time, there actually would be no teaching during those okay. months. I see. So it's a kind of a condensed um, block teaching kind of, okay. Um, it's um, nothing different though from how our courses are being delivered in Queens. So we're not condensing our teaching at all. It's just- Right, following. the same number of hours. Um, yes. Okay, I understand. And then the assessments are held quite close to um, that block of teaching. So our, our, so our final year exams would be held in May. Um, okay. We generally would be on site for those and um, for just any student queries that wouldn't probably be for six weeks. So we'd probably be just there for a shorter amount of time. Um, but yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can I add here some, some comments? Uh, the, the situation depends actually before the pandemic or during the pandemic. Before the pandemic, uh, travel was, as, as, as Kiva said, we will travel all together for the period of teaching and that really depends on the timetable some of the staff will start from the first week of september other will start maybe from the second or third week of september and we try to cover the period of teaching from end of august time till december time um, there will be natural break within this period like national holiday or other holidays then we will go back to uk for the winter holiday because there is no teaching anyway and we will come back for the second part of the year where March, April time maybe, and the examination take place in May. However, during the pandemic, uh, we were not able to travel. And uh, for that reason, we switched to this online learning uh, environment that Kiva talked to us, uh, talked, to, talked about. And we don't really know for the future. There are discussions on whether the new maybe mode of delivery will be a hybrid or it will go back to our business as before the pandemic. It is a discussion that is ongoing looking into through through these survey results and other surveys done by other staff in order to find a vision for what we can do the best for us as a team uh, for the students as a student learning experience and also in, in accordance with the with the with the new norm that is coming after the pandemic great thank you so much it's very helpful uh, david again i think and just one quick question you are running at the moment one program We've so the three, sorry. 
We have currently two degrees uh, from two degrees. So the 320 something students are in two degree programs. Yes. Okay, thank you. Are there any last questions? Wait a couple of minutes. Okay, going once, going twice. <laughs> Okay, then thank you so much, Dr. Kiva. That was a very interesting talk, very informative. Then I guess we'll move on to our uh, breakout sessions. So we can, I think, Melanie.